right, hello everyone. It is 7.01, so we will get started. Um, thank you so much for joining the first US webinar on Ray1 EMV. My name's Sam. I manage the commercial activities here in the US, and we're joined by Dr. Kirk Labor, the Medical Director and Chief of Surgery at the Eye Consultants of Texas. Uh, so Dr. Labor, it's great to have you here. I know that you. you're the reason everybody is uh, here today, so I'll keep my section as short as possible with just a brief overview of what EMV is. So EMV is Rayner's new non-diffractive IOL solution. It was developed in collaboration with Professor Graham Barrett, who most people know um, in relation to the Barrett formula. So it was great to work with him on the development of this lens. For anyone interested in learning more about the development process with Professor Barrett, how he personally cho chooses to utilize the lens, which does involve a one diopter offset, you can watch this great video that he's recorded at our YouTube channel, youtube.com youtube.com slash Rainer IOL. So with that, I'll, the first implanters as well, excuse me. Um, of course, Dr. Kirk Labor is joining us here today. We had a really strong cohort, um, which included Vance Thompson as well, and Bill Wiley, who was our first implanter of Ray one Aspheric in 2019, and Rob Weinstock, who has been a big help as well. So we've definitely been honored to have this great cohort of first implanters, which is rapidly growing. So with that, I'll jump right into the optic technology, what this lens is. It was designed to offer minimal dystrotopsia and high patient satisfaction. The core design principle of this lens is a center region which induces positive spherical collaboration, which blends seamlessly into an outer periphery, which ends um, with resultant negative SA. And so the point of this is reducing dystrotopsia uh, through a non-diffractive design and hopefully extending depth of focus as we know positive essay can do. A few studies. Here's a recent one um, in 2020, pioneered by Dr. Rocha, which found that higher positive essay led to better distance corrected near visual acuity than a negative essay group. And another study with a similar focus, which had the same result that negatively aberrated IOLs show statistically a lower reduction of essay and therefore worse distance corrected near visual acuity. So we're incorporating positive spherical collaboration to provide a little bit better depth of focus. Um, and yet the blended edge, re blended edge region, which has negative SA, um, maintains visual acuity and contrast sensitivity under mesopic conditions. So we'll see some graphics for what that looks like in a moment. Um, but it's worth mentioning as well that this optic doesn't have any kind of clear delineation. You won't see any sort of regions or zones. It's non-diffractive. Um, when you're implanting it, it'll look exactly the same as a standard monofocal. It's worth mentioning as well how the signs are determined for spherical collaboration. It's essentially whether marginal dioptric power is greater or less than the paraxial SA, and that's regardless of the Zernica coefficient. So what that would imply in the case of EMV is that this central region here has a slightly higher dioptric power than the periphery that induces negative SA. So to explain this a little bit more clearly, I think it's worth taking a look at the design principle behind the older spherical IOLs that used to be used a lot. With these, the issue with them is that the power increases from the center to the edge. So under mesopic light, when the pupil dilates, the peripheral light rays are hitting a focal point a little bit anterior to the fovea. Um, and so the stronger power, the light's over refracting, this decreases contrast sensitivity and visual acuity. And while it's well studied, of course, that this provides a little bit of additional depth with the older IOLs, um, the sacrifice was too great in terms of quality of vision. That is why the aspheric IOL um, was invented and popularized, which keeps the power uniform from center to edge. So with an aspheric IOL under mesopic light, when the pupils dilated, even the peripheral light rays are hitting the same focal point on the fovea, which is retaining really high contrast sensitivity and VA. So the design principle with Ray-1 EMV is essentially combining these two elements into a best of both worlds optic. So you have the positive spherical collaboration and additional depth of focus from a spherical IOL, and yet it's an aspheric optic that induces negative SA at the periphery. To demonstrate this, it's worth taking a look at a modulation transfer function. So here on the y-axis, you can see an MTF value, which is an indication of a lens's optical quality. So we can start looking at an aspheric monofocal that induces negative spherical aberration. This is most lenses available on the market today. You'll see that it has a really high MTF value, but the vision drops off really quickly. It's worth noting as well that it's pretty well researched that 
just obtaining the absolute highest MTF value possible isn't necessarily the best course of action. Um, there's more limiting the potential of human vision than just refractive accuracy or MTF value. There's you know, the electric signaling, the occipital cortex, um, all these things are limiting factors as well. And so it can be beneficial to the patient to use that light in a different way. So that's the design principle with Ray-1 EMV. We have, we've shifted this over a little bit and we're reutilizing this light. So we have a slightly lower MTF value, but you'll see that that comes with the pro of both a slight hyperopic and myopic shift. What that hyperopic shift is doing is for surgeons that choose to use EMV in a monovision setup that's retaining bilateral summation and stereoacuity. Um, this means that the near eye is providing a little bit of distance vision and connecting with the dominant eye set for distance. So that means you're going to have reduced asthenopia, and um, you can even consider expanding your offset beyond what you might have done in the past with the standard monofocal. So if you normally do a 0.5, I would say maybe experiment with the 0.75. You don't have to be concerned about asthenopia or losing stereoacuity the way you would with a standard monofocal. And of course, the myopic shift is great as well. Um, that's good at providing a little bit more intermediate and near vision. So you can compare this to eye hands, for example, which induces negative spherical collaboration and is fighting the eye's natural state. I think um, almost all natural healthy eyes induce positive spherical collaboration. So it's the design principle of this optic to rather than fight that, to complement it. Um, which is what we're doing here. So I hand still has great distance vision, high MTF value here, um, but they're losing a bit of that hyperopic shift and not quite myopic shift. I believe it's also a bit more pupil dependent as well. The last lens worth looking at is Vividi. Um, again, even a greater sacrifice on the MTF value here. It does seem to have a, a great myopic shift here, um, but definitely at the expense of some distance visual acuity. I think it's found um, in the FDA study, only something like 44% of patients have achieved 2020 distance vision. These are all great lenses. It's just um, what you're looking for, what your patient is looking for, understanding how they work and um, what they offer. So modulation transfer functions are great. I think um, even better is real world defocus curves, which is what we have here. This is collected data from a surgeon in Spain, Dr. Royo who targeted bilateral emetropia for all patients in both groups, both EMV and eye hands. So this is with no offset whatsoever, um, just in targeting both lenses for Plano. As you can see here, both groups achieved great distance vision. We're here at zero Logmar 2020 Snellen. EMV provides that little bit of a hyperopic shift I mentioned, which is gonna retain bilateral summation um, between the two eyes in a monovision setup. And where we really shine is of course, moving in um, to the shift myopically. So at negative 1.5, typically considered intermediate vision, um, again, both lenses are doing well, just about 0.1 logmar, which is great to see um, for targeting emetropia. Where we really shine in relation to IHANCE is moving from intermediate over to near. You can see here at the negative three range, um, indicative for near vision, that we're still retaining great uh, visual acuity here. Patients are getting about 0.25 um, logmar, which is functional vision. Uh, maybe a low ad power for near reading um, with some patients being spectacle independent, which we'll see in a moment, compared to about 0.75 here with eye hands, um, which generally isn't particularly functional or would need a higher ad power. So right up for this, Dr. Rowe found that EMV achieved a smoother profile along the entire curve. So not only is that great in a monovision setup, if a surgeon was to choose to use it in that way, um, hyperopically, but also myopically flattening that curve. There's gonna be um, less need to hit a refractive target spot on as well. It's a bit more forgiving as a result of having that entire curve. Um, and again, we've really shown from that negative two to negative three range. And Dr. Royo found in his study that 100% of patients were spectacle independent at distance and intermediate, that his average reading aid um, at 33 centimeters was just 1.5 diopters and that one in three of his patients actually had functional near vision without the need for spectacles whatsoever. So candidates of EMV, in my mind, um, you'll hear more about this from Dr. Labor, are essentially any patient that desires increased range of functional vision, which I think uh, generally is most. I think patients that are good for EMV are those that aren't good candidates for diffractive multifocals, whether that's because of a comorbidity, whether if that's the patient can't afford it, um, which we know is common. Um, Vividi and Panoptics, you know, great lenses, but they're premium lenses that can be quite expensive. 
EMV is classed as conventional and therefore is much more affordable to the patient. Of course, if a patient is as an intolerance for HOAs, then EMV would be a better choice for them than a diffractive monofocal um, because EMV has the, diffract the HOA profile of a standard monofocal. And again, patients willing to accept the possibility of needing low ad readers in order to maintain really high distance and intermediate vision would also be a good candidate. Um, they won't get as good of near vision in most cases as they would with a trifocal. Um, of course, there are trade-offs for that. So patients that want really high quality distance and intermediate willing to, to most likely need a low ad reader, um, that's a good, a good patient selection as well. In my mind, um, any new optic is only really as good as the platform it's on. So I wanted to take a look at this chart as well. We have the lowest NDEI rate in the industry. We're completely glistening free. And we have a really high Abbey value and refractive index. Both are indicators of really low chromatic aberration, um, high optical quality that's gonna result in low aberration and high contrast sensitivity and great visual acuity. Decentration is pretty much as good as it gets. Um, not necessarily super important for this lens in particular because it's non-diffractive, doesn't have any regions or zones. It's as forgiving as a monofocal, um, but still good to know that this won't be shifting in the eye. And is preloaded in a Ray-1 injector, which has a 1.65 millimeter nozzle, meaning that you can get this through a 1.8 millimeter wound assist or um, yeah, whichever, whichever uh, means you want. You'd have to expand that a bit if you want to go all the way in the bag. So here's a short clip of an EMV actually going into an eye. The injector is a push plunger. So you can see there's a free hand here to stabilize the eye. Because we're hydrophilic acrylic, we open much more quickly. You'll see that the haptics are sticking to the optic. You won't have to pry those off manually with the paracentesis. Um, those open right up, the optics unfolds, and it centers really well. You won't have to spend a lot of time trying to pry this thing open or getting the haptics off. Um, it opens right up for you. This video isn't sped up. It's just one of the, the benefits of a hydrophilic acrylic. Quick look at the injector as well. Just two steps. You leave the injector in the tray and fill it with about three mil of OVD. Once it's filled, you close these wings. You'll hear a click and it's ready for implantation. So it's as easy as that. Pretty hard to mess up. Last thing um, worth mentioning is that every unit of EMV comes with our free digital platform that collects all of the patient reported outcomes over a period of three years. Some of the metrics that this collects are satisfaction with outcomes, um, spectacle ind independence at distance, intermediate, and near, um, how much dysphotopsia these patients are experiencing, and a lot more factors like PCO. You can use these trends to promote your services, support appraisals. Of course, it's great just to know how these lenses are actually doing and how happy patients are with them. Um, I think you'll be happy with the results, which hopefully um, you know, promotes continued use for your patients. And of course, this is really fast and simple to use. I know that Dr. Labor actually uses it as well. Maybe he can attest to that. Um, but free with every IOL comes with this data, which is a really unique offering. And I think kind of turns the lens less from a product and more for a, a total overall solution for your practice. So in summary, surgeons find that EMV can provide excellent distance and intermediate vision with some functional near by targeting even just bilateral amitropia. For surgeons choosing to use an offset with this, I think you could expect to improve your near vision. Rear one EMV should be treated as a standard monofocal with regards to patient selection, and as such can be used in virtually any healthy eye. Um, for you as a surgeon, I would ask myself, would I implant a one piece um, acrylic IOL in the capsular bag? If the answer to that is yes, I think that EMV is a safe choice for the patient. Um, with the exception of high astigmatism, note that a toric version is not currently available. So managing astigmatism is at the surgeon's discretion. Ruin EMV provides the same level of dysphotopsia expected from monofocal. Again, that's virtually none because we're non-diffractive, no sort of region or zone. And outcomes will be optimized targeting slight myopia. That's principally due to that hyperopic shift that you see um, the near eye, both eyes in emetropia would still provide a little bit of that distance vision. So you're not sacrificing anything there. And by targeting a little bit of myopia, you're just ensuring that that intermediate and near is going to be as good as you want it to be. So technical information, last point, full power range of 10 to 30. The constants are available online. And I believe we've gone through the rest of this. Um, I know this was quick. If you have any lingering questions, um, actually there's a Q&A at the bottom. Where you, I'm sorry, you can enter your questions now. Um, and I'll filter through those while Dr. Labor is speaking. We can get to those. Also, feel free to email me here at samvanroon at rainer.com.
anytime. So with that, Dr. Laper, I'll uh, pass the mic over to you. Thanks, Sam. Really appreciate the opportunity to speak to everyone. Thanks for taking the time to be on the call. And thank you, Sam, for uh, asking me to participate. I got involved with uh, Rainer, I guess, within the last year, implanting the monofocal REO 600C, primarily because I was looking for something that would under, unfold a little more quickly uh, in the bag as opposed to the hydrophobic acrylics I had been using. Uh, and particularly for those patients that need an acrylic lens as opposed to a silicone uh, lens. Subsequent to that, um, uh, the EMP became available and I was excited to be able to put this in practice because I was very happy with the results I was getting with the um, RAO 600C and really look forward to something that um, would allow me to give my patients a range of vision without having to worry about the dysphotopsia issue or uh, as Sam mentioned, as well as those issues dealing with uh, asthenopia and true monovision setups. I had been doing many monovision using initially the Star Nanoflex and then uh, another monofocal subsequent to that and getting fairly good results with it. But when I learned about how the EMV worked and uh, the results uh, from Europe, I thought uh, maybe I need to use, uh, put this implant into use and uh, indeed, it's been a, a great benefit to the practice, at least thus far. And I think I put the first implant in um, maybe uh, six weeks ago, roughly. Um, it's easy, to, as Sam referenced and shown in, uh, in the video, it's easy to implant. It centers really, really well. Uh, he mentioned the high Abbey value. And again, as it relates to dysphotopsias, that's a big thing for me. The, the last thing uh, any of us wants to have to deal with is somebody that has uh, multifocal type lens and dealing with multi, uh, multiple issues as it relates to, to dysphotopsia. So big benefit there. And as he mentioned, the central positive spherical aberration helps extend the vision and peripheral reduction of uh, spherical aberration, manages visual acuity and the dysphotopsia. And then doing a one diopter ops offset really gives a nice range of vision. And as I'll show, at least in our initial outcomes, uh, our patients are getting independence, not only at distance and intermediate, but at near. So um, very, very happy with what we've seen so far. In terms of operating time, when we're doing high volume cataract surgery, the more efficient we can be in the operating room, the better. My scrub techs love the fact that they don't have to load a lens, um, which makes things flow a little easier and makes them worry less that we're gonna end up with an issue as it relates to that. Um, you know, it's a push uh, uh, plunger type injector. If you're not familiar with that, you need to be um, careful about how you begin to use it. Um, one of the things that uh, I noticed um, was that if you put the OVD in the injector system, um, and leave it on the back table, if you do that at the beginning of the case, then the lens tends to have a, there's a tendency for the lens to come out of that cartridge rather quickly. So uh, I, I would advocate putting the OVD in just before you're gonna use the, use the um, uh, or insert uh, the implant to help avoid that. And then slightly withdrawing um, the injector um, to uh, uh, prevent against a slight surge that you might see when the implant comes out, but it's very nominal. Um, I do have to give Bill Wiley credit for that because he's the one that uh, warned me against it when I first started putting the lens in. But again, it was very, it's a very nominal surge that you might see, but just backing off the injector a little bit um, helps avoid any potential issue you might have with that. Um, so for me, uh, initially, as I said, I, I used the implant for mini monovision patients and monovision patients. But now that I've seen the results that I have, and I'll present what, what I've got so far, um, I, I'm offering this to all patients that, um, that are interested in some presbyopia uh, uh, correction and independence in a, in, a, in a lens implant who can't necessarily afford uh, a premium lens. So anybody that um, uh, is interested, we're beginning to offer that to. Um, again, I mentioned the monovision and mini monovision that I initially used it for. 
these are just my personal sort of criteria that I look at before I'll uh, put one of these implants in somebody. I mentioned these things, uh, they're probably common sense to most everyone that's on this call. The astigmatism being sort of an iffy thing. And um, I suspect that before long, I'll begin offering this in astigmatism correction at the same time. Uh, so um, these are our initial outcomes. Now it's a small cohort. Um, I had my, uh, I had somebody set this up so that we were separating dominant and non-dominant eyes. Um, you can see that the uh, predicted spherical equivalent for the dominant eye and average spherical equivalent outcome uh, were very, very close. A slight um, uh, bit of that hyperopic shift that Tan, uh, Sam referenced. And the non-dominant eyes, interestingly enough, um, we saw uh, uh, a shift uh, in a more minus direction, at least initially. Now, I used Holiday 2 when I chose these in, um, uh, implant powers. Um, these are the uh, EMV visual acuity ranges that we saw for right and left eyes and then both eyes together. Again, a small cohort, but um, at least in our experience thus far, uh, patients are getting 20-20 at distance, 20-20 intermediate, 20-30 at near. So easily able to read newspaper print. Um, anecdotally, I can tell you, uh, none of the patients have uh, complained of any dysphotopsias. They're all very, very happy, which is one of the reasons I've begun to offer this to, to uh, most all our monofocal uh, eye well candidates that don't have some other comorbidity that would argue against it. These are the three formulas I typically look at. I have SRKT that I still use for a long time. I was a big uh, proponent of crystal lens and true line. Um, so we kept that formula in, the, uh, in those that I look at before I choose a lens power. But when you look at the dominant, non-dominant eye, when you look at the uh, predicted spherical equivalent compared to the uh, average sphere spherical equivalent outcome, there's, I mean, the difference is nominal. It's very nominal. Interestingly enough, SRKT seemed to be a little better for non-dominant eyes, where uh, dominant eyes, holiday two is a little better. You know, for that, we'll see if that continues as a trend as uh, we continue with looking at our outcomes, but very, very happy with our, our uh, targeted outcomes and visual acuities. So um, in summary, you know, as the EMV relates in my practice, given uh, my experience to date, as I mentioned, we're going to continue to offer it to many uh, monovision and monovision candidates, as well as all monofocal cataracts. It's kind of a middle tier pricing option. Um, and uh, I, I highlighted the significant degree of spectacle independence just from the standpoint of the outcomes that we've seen so far. So, um, you know, we'll keep doing this. And I, I'm really, really pleased with this implant. And, uh, and the future that it holds within our practice and being able to offer this to people who might not otherwise be able to afford presbyopia uh, correction. So very excited. Any questions? Dr. Leeper, one attendee has asked, um, what offset do you use? So we're currently using a one diopter offset as um, uh, Rainer recommended and um, uh, Again, very happy with that. So one diopter. Great. Uh, as it relates to that, I, you know, I may, once we get more experience here, I may shift that a little bit to see what kind of outcomes uh, we get with it. But thus far, I mean, it's really hard to argue with what we're seeing so far with what we're currently doing. Okay. Here's another question that I think uh, relies on your expertise, Dr. Labor. One person has asked, can this IOL be used in a clear lens exchange? Uh, my answer is yes. Um, you know, I think it's a great option for that. Um, uh, I see no reason why, why it shouldn't be uh, utilized as such. Um, look like there's a, is there another question there about the... Um, the there is, yeah. So I think in relation to your targeting, um, this person's asking if you plan to aim for negative 0.25 in the dominant eye or how you target the, the dom eye. So it's typically, it depends on what the 
calculations tell me, but it's roughly a quarter of a diopter to a third of a diopter in the minus direction, yeah. And you haven't noticed any sacrifice on distance visual acuity with that kind of targeting? No, no, not, um, no. I mean, patients have, have uh, it's either they, looking at the individual data, they, um, I think the, for OU, the 2020 was maybe 2020 minus two. Um, so, so nothing that's significant patients. Again, I'm not just out here saying this just to say it. <laughs> They've been very, very happy, and I've been really surprised and pleased. So. Great. I'm happy to hear it. Well, unless there's any other questions, I, uh, I really appreciate your time, Dr. Labor. It's been really great having you on. Um, Thanks, look Sam. forward to, to hearing more data in the future. I appreciate it. Sounds great. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye.